I'm Dr. Mark Attala, and I want to welcome you to my office. I'm a cognitive scientist who studies time travel and retrocausality, which is how the future impacts the present and the past. And today I want to talk to you about death, specifically near-death experiences and end-of-life dreams and visions, which are actually very different things. One of the problems in studying uh, this topic is running experiments, as you can imagine. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about how people have tried to um, examine this. So Dr. Sam Parnium, his idea was that uh, a lot of people who have near-death experiences describe themselves as floating. And so what he did is he got 15 hospitals to participate in this, where they, uh, in the room where they resuscitate patients, they put a shelf up high on the wall and a, a picture or an object up on that shelf. And so the doctors and the nurses who were in the room didn't know what was up there. And so a patient would have to float to the top of the room in order to see the picture. Now this was actually called the AWARE project, which is awareness during resuscitation. They ran it for four years and they had 2,060 patients who um, were resuscitated. It was a major bust though. I, wanna, uh, I don't wanna get your hopes up. Um, of those 2,060 patients, only two described themselves as floating. One died before they were able to interview, interview them fully. And the other, um, although they said that they, or they, they were able to describe the doctors who resuscitated them, um, were actually resuscitated in a room that didn't have anything up on the shelf. And so they didn't get anything from that. Uh, another area of research is people who interview people who, who've had near-death experiences. And in that community, they're called experiencers. So uh, as of 2020, over 600 articles have been written about people who have near-death experiences, and it's 3,500 experiencers. And they describe some commonalities, like uh, they are going down a tunnel, they see a bright light, and they see dead relatives. Um, there's a lot of problems with this research, though. For example, most of the people who do this research have a definite religious bias, and then they write books that have titles like um, Heaven is for Real, and uh, Heaven is True, and those kinds of titles. The other problem is that uh, the people who are describing their near-death experiences, they're doing it, they're, they're talking about it maybe years after it's occurred, and so we don't know if they're, um, if they're talking about what they wish had happened or if they're influenced by the researchers to describe uh, what happened in a way that the researcher wants to hear. But let's not be distracted by this. <clears throat> There's also research, uh, or an interesting thing about near-death experiences is that they tend to be um, similar across people from different cultures and different religious traditions. And so this has led researchers to think that maybe it's a biochemical reaction. And so it's something that's going on in the person's brain and that's why they experience this near-death experience. Uh, the bright light, the floating, etc. And so uh, they've looked at different drugs and which ones induce this near-death experience that are similar. Two drugs come to the forefront in this, ketamine, or special K, and DMT. And uh, in both cases, they, um, it, there's floating, there's an out-of-body experience, and there's hallucinations. Now, ketamine is synthetic, and so therefore it wouldn't be present in the human body. But DMT is much more promising because it is present in your brain. And people, uh, some people believe that it's released at birth, during dream states, and at death. And so that's a possible future avenue for research. Now, um, that's not a retrocausal explanation because if we want to look at the retrocausal explanation, we have to look at hospice patients who are very different from people who have near-death experiences because they know that they're dying. They've already been released from a hospital, they're in hospice, and they know they're, that they're going to die there. Now what they tend to experience are what are called end-of-life dreams and visions. 
And these are very different from near-death experiences. So, 88% of hospice patients describe having had end-of-life dreams and visions, and 99% of those people say that they're as real as anything they experienced in life. So, what kind of things do they see? Usually, uh, not just dead relatives, but people who are alive also. So, they, they tend to see that. How are they different? Um, and, and why is this uh, compelling evidence? A couple of different things. Um, one is that the patient's condition is related to their end-of-life dreams and visions. So, if they um, start getting better, the number of uh, dreams and visions that they have tends to decrease. And then, as they decline, um, they increase again. Another important aspect is that these occur when the people are awake. And so they see relatives who've passed away in the room with them when they're awake. Um, one patient said, you know, I love my Uncle Harry, but the guy won't shut up because he keeps on talking to him. And Uncle Harry's been dead for 46 years. There was another woman who, her dead, who, who was very religious, and she thought that she would see angels, but instead she was seeing uh, two dead ants of hers. And so she couldn't understand why she was seeing them when uh, she expected to see angels. This is important because it argues against the idea that there are some kind of demand characteristics going on, that people are seeing what they want to see. They're seeing their Uncle Henry, and they're seeing um, their dead ants when they expect to see angels. The third point is that they also see people who are alive in their dreams and visions, but the number of people who are alive decrease as the person approaches death. And when they're near death, they only see dead relatives. So what's the retrocausal explanation of this? Well, they, the patients think that they're seeing people from their past, but actually, they're seeing people from their future, their very near future, when they've passed on to the next world, too. And so, William Faulkner once said that the past is never forgotten. It's not even past. And in this case, it's people from your past who are in your future and guiding you towards that future. So death, properly understood, is a retrocausal phenomenon. So if you're interested in this, uh, in more stuff on retrocausality, pick up my book, Psychology and Retrocausality. I would also encourage you to visit us on the web at retrocausality.org to see if you're retrocausally sensitive. If you'd like to support my research, I have a link below on Patreon. Otherwise, I'd ask you to like and subscribe and share this video. And otherwise, I will see you in the future and have a great day.